Welcome back to our study of 2 Kings. We just thought at the end of our last session that the Syrians were going to leave the people of Israel alone, but they are not. So we saw at the end of the last session that uh, Elisha had prayed for God to blind the army of the Syrians that had come to try to capture him. And then Elisha led uh, that army to uh, Samaria, to where the king of, of uh, Israel was. And then they uh, were treated like captives and they were sent home. And it said they no longer raided Israel. So it sounds like they're going to leave Israel alone, but they're not. In fact, where we pick up the story today, they are going to come and besiege the capital city of Samaria, and things are going to get even worse for Israel than they were before. Now, before we dig into this uh, story of the siege and God's surprising deliverance, well, not surprising that he does deliver them, but the way he delivers them is surprising. Uh, before we dig into that, one thing I want to note that whenever there's a siege, there's usually going to be a famine if the siege lasts very long. And whenever there's a famine, there can be horrible, horrible things done that we don't like to think about or talk about. And in this story, we're going to read about one of those terrible, horrible things that happened during this siege that you might not want young children to hear about. So I just want to give you a heads up before we get going that uh, you might want to um, make sure the little kids are not listening. All right, now let's jump in. 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 24. It says, Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. So there you go. He's setting a siege around Samaria. Samaria at this time is the capital city of the nation of Israel, right? The northern kingdom. So they're besieging the city. Verse 25, And there was a great famine in, Sy in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver <clears throat> and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now, we need some help translating that, right? Because we don't use a cab as a unit of measurement and we don't uh, buy things with shekels. So what are these shekels worth? And what is this fourth part of a cab? What, what, is, what is that? All right, so he says, the famine is so bad that a donkey's head is being sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's about 32 ounces of silver. You might have a note, a footnote uh, in your Bible as I do that tells you how much a shekel weighed. And you can do the math from there. 32 shekels, or excuse me, 32 ounces of silver, roughly. That's 80 shekels of silver to buy a donkey's head, which is probably not terribly desirable for food, right? And then the second thing it mentions is a fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now that, that comes down to about a quart of dove's dung, which again, not something that you would particularly want. And a quart is not a whole lot for five shekels of silver. That's about two ounces of silver, right? Think about how valuable silver is, spending two ounces of silver to buy a quart of dove dung. That's how bad the famine was during this siege. Now, verse 26. Now, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king asked her, in other words, I, I can't do anything, right? Verse uh, 28. And the king asked her, what is your trouble? She answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day, I said to her, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Okay, so there's the horrible, horrifying uh, thing that I talked about. In the siege, the famine is so bad that these two women came to an agreement to eat their own children. Now, the horrifying part of that story is not that one woman uh, sort of tricked the other into the two of them eating her son, claiming that they would eat the other woman's son the next day, and then that woman hid her son. That's not the horrifying part. The horrifying part is that the two of them were so desperate that they would even uh, discuss and then participate in such an agreement in the first place, 
That's how desperate these people were, how awful these circumstances, these circumstances were, right? Uh, and then it says, <clears throat> verse uh, 30, when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall. And the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. So he was also in distress, perhaps in mourning, right? And verse uh, 31, it says, and he said, may God do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now, what is going on here? Now, uh, the king, remember, the king of Israel is the son of Ahab. We haven't been reminded of this king's name for a while. We have to kind of go back in the story uh, to get his name. But uh, he was a son of Ahab. And he was not a good king. Now, he, uh, he wasn't as bad in some ways as Ahab. But here's what we read about this king back in 2 Kings chapter 3. <clears throat> it says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother. For he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from it. Remember, Jeroboam's sin, uh, in part, was uh, to set up the, the two golden calves, the two idols, in um, Dan and Beersheba, so that the people of Israel would worship those idols instead of going uh, to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. So, idolatry is at the heart of Israel's uh, failure, Israel's sin, from the beginning with King Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, all the way until Israel is taken into exile because of their idolatry, which we'll come to later, Lord willing, in, uh, in this book, in 2 Kings. But notice that um, just like Ahab had called Elijah the troubler of Israel, right? He thought that Israel's problems were Elijah's fault when really Elijah was just the, the messenger of God to the king and to Israel, telling them, uh, you know, what God had said and, and addressing their idolatry and their sin, right? In the same way, this king, this son of Ahab, is also speaking like the, the, the siege, the problems that Israel is experiencing there in Samaria are Elisha's fault, but they are not Elisha's fault, and they are not God's fault, Right? Elisha, remember, represents God as his prophet, his spokesman. God is with Elisha. We've seen that throughout the miracles of Elisha. But Elisha is not the one who has brought this trouble on Israel. Instead, uh, her kings right, are the ones who brought this, uh, this problem on her. Right? And there's no, the, the way we know that, so there's no plain statement in this chapter Right about here's why this siege is happening. But we don't really have to guess. We, we can be pretty confident about why this is happening. Right? Um, the people's persistent idolatry, right? That's a, that's a theme, right? Is almost certainly the reason for this siege. And here's how we know that. Because that's going to lead to their exile. And God had warned them about that in advance. But back in Deuteronomy 28, when God is telling the people... If you don't obey me, if you don't keep my commandments, so for example, if you commit idolatry, if you do have other gods before me, here are the kinds of things that are going to happen. And these words that I'm about to read to you, I think they are fulfilled later than this moment. They have to do with something even, even worse uh, and on a larger scale than this moment. But this moment we're reading about is sort of a, a prelude, a precursor, to these worst things that are going to happen. And it's it seems evident to me it's happening for the same reason, right? It's happening because of their idolatry, because of their unfaithfulness to God. So here's what they were warned about in Deuteronomy 28 if they didn't keep God's commands. This is uh, verses 52 and 53 of Deuteronomy 28. Right? It says, They shall besiege you, talking about enemies, they shall besiege you in all your towns, and you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies will distress you. 
right? So it's not Elisha's fault. The king is talking like Elisha has brought this on Samaria, but in fact, it's not Elisha's fault and it's not God's fault. It's the fault of the king and anybody else who's been participating in this idolatry. Uh, that's what has brought this terrible event upon the people of Israel in Samaria. Now, Elisha knows uh, what the king is up to. We saw earlier that Elisha knew what the king of Syria was up to earlier in chapter 6, and uh, it made the king of Syria upset. He tried to hunt Elisha down, and uh, that's when uh, his army ended up being blinded and led like captives to the king of Israel. In the same way, when the king of Israel tries to do away with Elisha, it's not going to work. Elisha knows what's coming. Um, he's God's prophet, right? And God can reveal anything to him. So verse 32 says, Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the, messengers, the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Do you see how this murderer <clears throat> has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down to him and said, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Right? So that sounds like um, this is what the king right, has sent his messenger to say. Right? The messenger came down and said, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord? In other words, he's blaming God, it sounds like, and saying, Why should I keep waiting on God if God is the one who is doing this to us, right? But of course, as we've seen, God's not doing this to them in the sense of it's like God's fault, right? It's their fault. They need to uh, repent and turn back to the Lord and get rid of their idols. And uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to wait on the Lord if you're not turning from the thing that God is trying to get your attention about, right? That God is bringing discipline into your life uh, for, right? So uh, you, you can't have it both ways, right? Uh, so now into chapter seven, but Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. So Elisha is predicting here a great deliverance, right? We just read how expensive it was to get a donkey's head or even a small portion of dove dung to eat. But Elisha is saying tomorrow in 24 hours, right, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel. Again, we have to use our footnotes, Bible notes, to help us figure out how much this is. <clears throat> um, and so a sea of fine flour is seven quarts. Right, so that's quite a bit, right? Seven quarts of fine flour for one shekel. Or two seas of barley, that's 14 quarts of barley for one shekel. Right, that's, a, that's much more reasonable, right? Those are probably normal prices right, for food. So Elijah is saying, essentially, the problem is going to be gone. There's going to be food enough and plenty that we won't have these crazy prices for things that aren't even really food. And the messenger or the captain who's with the king is um, incredulous, it appears. He, he can't believe it, right? He says, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? In other words, it's almost as if he's saying, is it even possible for God to make something like that happen? If God rained down food from heaven, could what you said even come to pass? Like, is, it, is that even possible? Now, um, here's the problem with that, right? Uh, there's two problems with this man's response. Number one, God can open the windows of heaven and rain food down because he's done that before, right? Remember the manna in the wilderness in the Old Testament or earlier in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus when the Israelites have come out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness. God feeds them with manna from heaven uh, daily, 
right, for years. So God can open the windows of heaven and provide food for a large number of people. He's done it before. This uh, man is acting like God can't even do that, which he's already done. That's the first problem. And the second problem, now, and again, now, before we get to the, to the second problem, we might think, okay, we know God can do that, but we wouldn't expect God to do that. We, don't, we know that God doesn't do miracles like that all the time just because we want him to. So what's the problem with saying, I doubt that's going to happen? Like, I think God could do it, right? But what if I'm not sure that God's going to do it? Here's why in this story, that's a problem, right? The second reason is because Elisha, who is an authentic prophet of God, right? Who has already demonstrated that God is with him, that God is working powerfully through him. Um, he has said that God will do it. And so to doubt Elisha's word at this point is pretty close, very similar. In some ways, you might could even say almost the same as doubting God's written word in the Bible. Elijah just said, God is going to do this. And this captain said, how could that possibly happen? It's, it's very similar to how Zechariah responds in the New Testament when the angel tells him that his wife is going to have a son, is going to bear John the Baptist. And he says, how can this thing be? And Gabriel says something like, I just came from the presence of God to tell you that, <laughs> right? That's how you can know this is going to happen. He said, that's what he says, how can, the, how can I know this is going to happen? Uh, and Gabriel's like, I just, I came from God to tell you it's going to happen. That, that's how you know, right? And so he was struck dumb uh, until uh, the time of John's birth. So something similar is going to happen here, although something worse, right? Elisha says to this man, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. So you, you're going to see come to pass what I told you is going to happen, but you're not going to get to enjoy it. You're not going to get to share in it. And that brings us to the last part of the story. And this is just a brilliant piece of storytelling. I'm going to try not to interrupt it too much. All right, here we go, starting in verse three. Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Okay, so basically, at least we have a chance of surviving if we go to the camp of the Syrians where there's food. If we stay here or try to go in the city, we're just going to die. There's nothing here to sustain us. So verse 5. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. Why? What happened? Verse 6. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army. So that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. All right, so what had happened, the, the camp is not guarded, right? And what had happened was, again, God had caused them, caused the army of the Syrians to hear what sounded to them like armies coming to attack them, and they came to the conclusion, the king of Israel's hired these armies to come and fight against us. We're in big trouble. And so they ran for it. They fled. They got out of there. So here's what happens next. Verse 8. And when the lepers came, lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. So they had food, they had drink, they're plundering this camp. Verse 9, then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. Think about that phrase, good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, 
Let us go and tell the king's household. So they they uh, get food, they get drink, they get plunder, and then after a while they realize, okay, they, they uh, perhaps their consciences right start to bother them. This is not right. If we get caught out here enjoying the spoils of this huge camp all by ourselves while the rest of the people are starving to death in the city, we are going to be in big trouble. We've got to go tell people this good news. We've got to go let them know what we have found. Now, before we go on further, we should think about this, right? We, in many ways, are like these beggars, right? We have uh, stumbled upon, so to speak, good news like they did, right? We have been given the gospel. We have heard, we have learned that God has loved us, that God sent his son for us, that God's own son gave up his life for us. He died on the cross. He rose again so that we could have life and forgiveness and salvation and reconciliation with God and, and resurrection and all the rest. And we can't sit on that good news and keep it to ourselves, right? We, that wouldn't be right. We need to spread it. We need to share it. We need to make it known. All right, now here's what happened next. Verse 10. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, <clears throat> there was no one to be seen or heard there, nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents as they were. Then the gatekeepers called out, and it was told within the king's household. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking, when they come out of the city, we shall take them alive and get into the city. Now, the king, is pause there, the king is afraid of a trap, which is understandable to a certain extent, except perhaps for the fact that, that he probably knows what Elisha had said about tomorrow there's going to be food aplenty, right? The siege is going to be over, in other words. Um, and so perhaps his first thought shouldn't have been, it's a trap, but Elisha was right. God is keeping his promise that he made through Elisha. Verse 13, and one of his servants said, let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will fail, fare like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. So let's send out five horses. If they stay here, they're going to die too. Let's get, send them out and just see if the army is there or not. <clears throat> Verse 14. So they took two horsemen, and the king sent after them the army of the Syrians, or excuse me, sent them after the army of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste, and the messengers returned and told the king. So in other words, they found a trail of the Syrian army, leaving all kinds of stuff behind because they were getting out of there as fast as they could. So verse 16, then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Just what God said through Elisha has come to pass when he said it would. All right. Verse 17, Now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gate so that he died, as the man of God had said when the king came down to him. For when the man of God had said to the king, Two seas of barley shall be sold for a shekel, and a sea of fine flour for a shekel about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria, the captain had answered the man of God, <clears throat> if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he had said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. So Elisha's word came to pass, both about the food and the fate of the man who doubted God's word. We must remember that God is able to do more than we can imagine. And when he promises that he will do something, he will do it. And we should trust him. Amen.